The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Russia and China tightly filter what their citizens see online. And some liberal democracies are seeking to ensure data privacy for their citizens or ban social media apps. Does it all lead to a splintering of the once blissfully global World Wide Web? We'll debate that tonight. Then CNN's Brian Stelter breaks down the argument of his new book, Hoax, that Fox News and Donald Trump have cemented a wholly unhealthy interdependence that's bad for democracy. It's Wednesday, October 7th, and that's tonight on The Agenda. In the early days, the great promise of the Internet was right in its name, World Wide Web. That is, a global platform that transcended national boundaries and authorities. But as governments and other state actors increasingly seek to exert their power and even sovereignty over cyberspace, might the Internet become the splinternet? With us to consider that, in Stanford, California, Eileen Donahoe. She's executive director of the Global Digital Policy Incubator at Stanford University and a former U.S. ambassador to the United Nations Human Rights Council. In Cambridge, Massachusetts, Dipayan Ghosh, author of Terms of Disservice, How Silicon Valley is Destructive by Design. He's also co-director of the Digital Platforms and Democracy Project at the Shorenstein Center on Media Politics and Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. And in Brooklyn, New York, Scott Malcolmson, author of Splinternet, How Geopolitics and Commerce are Fragmenting the World Wide Web. He's also a principal at the consulting group Future Map. And it's great to have you three with us on TVO tonight for this important discussion. I want to start by just setting up our conversation by reading something that was written almost a quarter century ago by the Electric Frontier Foundation's co-founder, John Perry Barlow. And this is what he called a declaration of the independence of cyberspace. Sheldon, the graphic, if you would, and let's go. Governments of the industrial world, he wrote, you weary giants of flesh and steel, I come from cyberspace, the new home of mind. On behalf of the future, I ask you of the past to leave us alone. You are not welcome among us. You have no sovereignty where we gather. We have no elected government, nor are we likely to have one. I declare the global social space we are building to be naturally independent of the tyrannies you seek to impose on us. You have no moral right to rule us, nor do you possess any methods of enforcement. We have true reason to fear. Governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed. You have neither solicited nor received ours. Okay, Scott, get us started here. That uh, pretty provocative thing was written almost 25 years ago. How would you describe the vision for the Internet around this time? Uh, well, you know, like the French Revolution, what bliss it was in that dawn to be alive. Everything looked as though the single model, as Francis Fukuyama told us, of liberal, open, democratic government and free markets was going to take over the world. And the Internet was seen as, as kind of the, um, as an electronic uh, borderless analog of that, that speech would become free across borders and the, the power of the state would wither away. So none of that really has happened. Uh, and and the powers of the state have, have steadily increased with respect to cyberspace and, and, and the World Wide Web. Uh, initially, in the 90s, when you started having the ability to you know, actually participate on the web as a sort of non-geek human being, uh, it was completely dominated by the United States. It was completely dominated by U.S. companies. The real battles for freedom were between, really between the geek community and the United States government, which wanted to control various forms of content like pornography and drug dealing and money laundering. But once those issues were more or less worked out in the 2000s, there seemed to be a, a relatively open plane of an international platform. Really, it wasn't until the Snowden revelations that governments began to push back really hard uh, against a US dominated system although that had been that had been in the cards since the since the mid 90s really it was a gradual process of kind of the reassertion of state power up to today when it continues to be asserted uh, ever more Eileen let me repeat one of the quotes in that Barlow piece you have no sovereignty 
he wrote 24 years ago. Have governments around the world listened to that admonition? No, 24 years later, absolutely not. We've seen, you know, a radical, radical flip of John Perry Barlow's vision. But, but I do want to say that at the time, he really did capture something important, and I don't want to forget that he wasn't wrong in those early days. Um, and he was, he was a visionary and a wonderful genuinely libertarian spirit, and he was very influential on that early community. And he was right in the sense that at that time, the early internet was a challenge to governments for the very simple reason that you know, the inherent feature, global, trans-border, instantaneous communication is inherently challenging to a, a model of nation states defined by territorial boundaries. And um, it was challenging to governments at the time. And there was a phase for about a decade of this sense of liberty and that the early days were that the internet would be beneficiary to civil society actors, human rights activists around the world, and that authoritarian governments would not be able to catch up. That was mistaken, but I but I will say it, full decade, 2000, uh, 2011, the Freedom Online Coalition was formed, which was a coalition of governments supporting this vision of the global open interoperable internet for civil society. 2012 was the first UN resolution on internet freedom proclaiming this idea that human rights must be protected online as offline. It did come to an end um, the next year with the Snowden revelations, where there was this sense that democratic governments themselves were not adhering to these principles. And on some level, we've almost never recovered from that moment. Well, Depayan, we now see a situation where we have what Eileen just described. We have Russia pursuing its own values on the internet. We have China certainly pursuing its own way of doing business. Um, obviously, the expression that we're considering tonight is that it's turning from the internet into the splinter net. Is that how you would describe what we're seeing today? Absolutely. Um, I, I think that what we're what we're seeing is uh, something that I'd, I'd say is a parallel to the way that the global economy operates. Actually, where you know we have we have a massive game of of uh, more than two hundred countries. Uh, each has uh, relationships with the other countries. Um, some of those relationships are, are uh, of course, uh, strained in various ways. Some of them are blocked in various ways. Um, and I think we're seeing something similar now with the Internet, um, where, uh, as, uh, as others have mentioned, uh, at one point this was, this was a, a tremendously powerful idea that anyone on the globe can, can, could communicate with anyone else uh, over, this, over this communication platform. But, uh, but that medium has, has been, of course, uh, wielded by governments in various ways, in, in, a, in a very similar way to how uh, we see the glo uh, global economy uh, evolve over the past uh, past several decades, and um, I think I think uh, increasingly it is becoming a splinter net, uh, spearheaded by the efforts of uh, on, on on one side the United States, uh, on the other side uh, China, and and maybe in the middle uh, the European approach, hmm. uh, with a lot of countries following suit. Well, let me follow up with Scott on that. Uh, you know, it's probably a given that totalitarian countries would want to get their mitts on this Internet. Uh, but we've seen democracies also want to do it as well. Were we all a bit perhaps naive to think that this was not going to happen over the course of the last quarter century? Uh, well... Sort of. Um, I mean, the you know, as 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 both Depayan and Ambassador Dano have pointed out, the you really have to always keep in mind the role of the private sector. The bulk of the internet is uh, built by private companies and maintained by private companies and controlled by private companies, and that's likely to remain the case. And so, the it it isn't all government. It is, the governments are only one actor. And for example, if you take the big example today, you look at Huawei. Huawei is a large, large Chinese company that's built five, you know, 3G, 4G, and now 5G networks around the world. So it's doing that with the help of Chinese state subsidies. So in that sense, it is, uh, you could say, to a degree, an arm of the Chinese government. But at the same time, it is a, it is a private company. And, and the, 
the the ability of government governments are in a contest on the internet and in the web with private companies. They always have been, and I think they will be for a very, very long time. So I think it's very important to keep the private sector part in mind. You know, when, when Ambassador Donahoe spoke about the early web, you know, the re, one of the most, the, the web would not developed as an international platform uh, in a sense if it hadn't been one, by which I mean the companies that developed, whether they were, you know, Google or Infospace, you know, the successes and the failures, they were building for a planetary platform. If it had not started as a planetary platform, it would have been built out completely differently. I think what we're facing now is the possibility that private companies will have to only innovate for national internet spaces. And that's going to lead to a different internet because they'll develop differently for, for it. So, you know, in my view, the big spaces are North America, uh, uh, India, China, and possibly Europe, depending on how it is that Europe decides to to regulate these. There is a dividing line between the authoritarian and the democratic. It's become extremely popular in both the Democratic and Republican Party in the United States and to an increasing extent in Europe to divide the virtual world into these two categories. Uh, I think there are a lot of risks in, in doing that, but I also don't think it's exactly going to work out that way, precisely because the, there are too many private actors. The, the, the scale of investment is not a government scale of investment. Hmm. I do wonder, uh, and, and Eileen Donahoe, forgive me, I don't know you well enough to call you by your first name. I should have called you Ambassador Donahoe <laughs> earlier. <laughs> Uh, I, I, you know, Scott has, has really raised a, a fascinating issue for us on, on whether or not how democracies handle the Internet versus how authoritarian or totalitarian countries handle it, whether those two ideas are, you know, frighteningly getting closer together. What's your view on that? That's a great question. And the, the answer has to be somewhat nuanced. Um, so the first thing I would say is that the rise of digital authoritarianism, and in particular, the Chinese model of it, is a very concerning development. And um, it has three dimensions that I would emphasize. One is utilization of digital technologies for repression at home, censorship, surveillance, information control, as well as role modeling that model of that use, those uses to other countries. Second is the export of digital technologies for repressive purposes, as well as the export of infrastructure, uh, especially 5G infrastructure, communication infrastructure, through which they also are able to suck up data back home. And that's the Huawei challenge. Uh, third piece is growing influence in uh, international diplomacy, international norms bodies, especially entities where there is tech governance and standard setting happening. Uh, and there is an, an effort to ensure that the Chinese approach to technology standards and protocols are embedded into the technologies of the future. So that is one very real concern, and we should, we should all keep our eye on that. That said, I agree with Scott that um, we can't deny the fact that democratic governments also are unconsciously drifting toward authoritarian uses of technology in law enforcement, immigration purposes, because they have not yet gotten their acts together and gotten their heads around how they actually adhere to democratic values and protect human rights in the digital realm. And that is the big responsibility and task for the democratic world. Hmm. Well, Dupayan, let me get you to follow up on that. I, I guess China and its approach to things has certainly been an example for other authoritarian countries. But how concerned are you that it's actually becoming also an approach for democratic countries. Well, I, I think I think we're already seeing evidence of this that that it is becoming an approach, and and we can we can look at the United States as as one example, of course, uh, where we have a combination of industrial policy now in in 2020, um, and uh, and and various forms of uh, of of censorship, foreign censorship, uh, taking place. Now, I'm not trying to associate this with necessarily the Trump administration. I'm not saying that it wouldn't have happened in uh, in other administrations, but uh, I think we're we're certainly seeing uh, a splitting of of uh, the u s and china in in governance of the internet. and um, and a lot of it is is about retaliation. 
Um, and I'd make a point here and, and, and just suggest that while this, in the current moment, this does suggest that, that perhaps we're moving further and further into a splinter net, uh, I would also say that uh, a lot of these things might be quite temporary in the sense that uh, because it is associated with uh, the administration um, and because uh, the Trump administration has uh, attempted to uh, uh, retaliate in certain ways against uh, China, um, as well as other other uh, states as well. For instance, um, uh, India working against China to, to ban uh, TikTok. In that case, um, a lot of these are, are uh, a lot of these actions from governments are are motivated by underlying politics, and politics are temporary. Politics can can shift with the winds, and we might very well see either. Of course, you know we might see the splinter net uh, furthering. Uh, in the coming years, or we might actually see uh, see people coming back together again, uh, depending on those uh, political circumstances uh, around the world. Well, let me pursue those notions with Scott. And, and yes, politics are temporary, but sometimes, uh, Scott, and I'll point you to Iran, uh, temporary has so far meant 40 years, which I guess, you know, when you consider history, that's temporary. But if you consider those of us who are your age and mine, that feels like a very long time. Uh, I wonder if you could do some comparing and contrasting for us here. How the Iranian government has attempted to control the Internet versus what, what's happening in Europe right now, and maybe point us to France, where the president there, Emmanuel Macron, has used the term digital sovereignty. So maybe compare what Iran has done with the kind of digital sovereignty that the French are talking about. Okay. Um... I might bring in a couple of other things, too, because particularly as Dupayan mentioned India, which is in, in a whole lot of ways the most interesting place in, in cyberspace right now. The, uh, to my mind, what's going to lead to more of a splinter net is not so much governments as it is the private sectors. Uh, most private sectors, including in France, uh, including in India, um, not perhaps so much in Iran, uh, certainly in other places, Nigeria, Brazil, and so on. They want to have their own tech sectors that will be able to design technological products and innovate for their own, uh, for the good of their own companies. That's, that's not unusual. And that, uh, because the technology uh, is so relatively accessible compared to, say, the technology to drill, uh, deep drill oil, uh, you can have sectors increasingly uh, sort of flattened across the world. So if you look at, um, if you look at venture capital spending over the last five years, it was basically about say 60% in the US in high technology five years ago, now it's about 45%. So that other money is going to other countries. Uh, Southeast Asia is incredibly innovative. There's a lot of investment in Southeast Asia in new technology companies. So my point being that the sovereignty of, of, of the cyberspace of a particular nation is in part an effect of the vitality of its own tech sector. That is to a degree a political relationship. In India, for example, with this company called Reliance Geo, which just recently invested $20 billion in order to basically take over the communications, telecommunications market of uh, 1.3 billion people. Uh, that was done with the cooperation, to say the least, of the Indian government, because it was seen as a way Reliance was helping the Indian government establish cyber sovereignty, particularly in the face of China, but also in the face of US companies and even European companies. Similarly, what Macron wants to do is to create a situation where at least European and probably preferably French, tech companies are able to innovate and have a market rather than simply take all their products, uh, whatever Google and Facebook and whomever else are able to send over from the United States, or even worse, whatever China is able to, to send over from Beijing to France. So the sovereignty question is a private sector question as well as a government question. And in, in some ways, the private sectors actually lead it and governments end up following. Hmm. Whether that's a good thing or not is a separate question. But I think structurally, that's the way that it's tended to work. Well, let me follow up with Ambassador Donahoe and, and let us do a little navel gazing here, because I'm sure people watching want to know, where's Canada in all of this? And certainly one of the things that we can say about Canada is that apparently, I'm told 80% of our internet traffic automatically routes through the United States. So from a Canadian perspective, this notion of digital sovereignty that uh, the French president talked about, is it basically impossible for Canadians? Mm. Well, <laughs> what I would say is I hope that the 
Democratic Alliance, Canada, the United States, you know, the transatlantic partners, find a way to come back together and have a shared vision and rebuild trust. That has obviously been broken, especially during the Trump administration for many reasons, um, but not exclusively the Trump administration. Uh, and yet at this moment, that is our task. We really do need to find a, a shared vision for a democratic approach to governance of digital society writ large, for regulation of, of the private sector, uh, and for thinking about utilization of technology by governments. But uh, going, and I, I understand why the Canadians might feel nervous or even, um, you know, feel like they, they too want to pull back from the United States in terms of where their data is. I think it would be a bad move. And let me let me also go back to this larger trend of moving toward digital sovereignty around the world. I think we need to differentiate. The China approach is really a model of government control. Mm -hmm. Sovereignty for purposes of saying, it's nobody else's business what happens in our border. That, that happened pre-digital with the Chinese, and now they're finding a way to articulate that vision in a digital context, and they're doing it very effectively. And it's attractive to other governments who say, maybe we want to have that level of control as well. In Europe, the animating energy behind the move toward digital sovereignty, data localization, is actually the opposite. It is intention to protect the rights of citizens. I would argue it has, it's, it's understandable, but it has an unfortunate effect of really dividing the democratic alliance, which I think will become a, a problem and that we need to band together our data, our technology, and our norms. We need to come together again. Last but not least, the Trump administration. I would say uh, it, it, I, we hope it ends soon. <laughs> and it has been a <laughs> period um, where incoherence of, of the policies, and it's not even clear that they're pushing toward digital sovereignty intentionally. It's just ad hoc policies that have that appearance and that don't make sense. When you look at what TikTok and WeChat, both of which have preliminary injunctions against the executive orders, so our federal courts are standing up there. I think their position on Huawei was understandable. I think the movement on the... Uh, semiconductor industry in China, understandable. But we have to remember they also went after our own private sector uh, platforms with an executive order in May because they're uh, because of so-called censorship against Trump for taking down tweets. And that was a form of retaliation against American companies. So I, I think we need to just hope we get past this administration and have a rational set of policies going forward that brings the democratic alliance together. Well, one does note that the European Union have taken some steps to, in spite of the shared values that uh, Ambassador Donahoe just described of Western nations on this, they have tried to achieve uh, some greater digital sovereignty. And, um, you know, that's the European Union. Um, is that a possible template uh, for Canada to take? If it, in spite of those shared values, would like to have a little more sovereignty over its digital footprint? Absolutely. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I think that uh, Canada, uh, to, to its strengths, has, has actually taken uh, some steps already in, in, uh, in trying to launch new national privacy initiatives, in, in trying to renegotiate the balance of power uh, between dominant uh, Internet companies and the, uh, the, the Canadian citizen. Um, in uh, exactly the way that Europe has done. Let's step back for a second and look at the general data protection regulation that, that Europe uh, put forward. Uh, intellectually, theoretically, I think we can all agree uh, that it is, it, it's, it's a foundational document. It, it is uh, fantastic uh, in, in the way that it, um, it gives the consumer rights, uh, rights to deletion, rights to uh, have to consent, rights to choice. Um, uh, rights to, to opting out of algorithmic processing. Uh, 
Um, and, and those kinds of rights fly in the face of, of Facebook's business model, for instance, which is why we've seen the tech industry lobby against that so hard. So intellectually, it's a fantastic framework. Of course, the way that it works is that the EU puts this principled framework forward, and then the 28 member states have to enforce it in the way that they wish, um, which has led to some some people suggesting that it hasn't been as effective as it could be, the GDPR. Um, that said, again, intellectually, I think that it is a very protective uh, set of rights and gives Europe and Europeans uh, the, the rights that they need in perpetuity. Um, and we, we all would hope that uh, they're able to, Europe is able to enforce those rights through the member states. If Canada were to do something similar, I think, uh, I think it would be fantastic. And in fact, um, uh, in, in fact I think uh, Canada is thinking now about uh, finding ways to renegotiate that balance of power. And uh, to that end, you know, I, I, I think that in the United States, um, we need to do that uh, as well. Well, let me pick up on that. We're down to our last couple of minutes here. And Scott, maybe I'll get you to react to this graphic that I'm next going to read. This is a quote from Rebecca McKinnon's 2012 book, Consent of the Network, The Worldwide Struggle for Internet Freedom, in which she writes, we have begun to see how absolute power in cyberspace corrupts absolutely as it does in the physical space. As with power in the physical world, power in the digital world must be constrained, balanced, and held accountable. The future of the freedom in the Internet age depends on the choices and actions of everybody on the planet who creates, uses, and regulates technology. It depends on whether we assert our rights within the digital spaces we now inhabit, just as our forebears fought for their rights in the physical spaces once controlled entirely by sovereigns who claimed to have the right to rule as they pleased. Okay, Scott, that's eight years ago. I wonder, eight years later, what grade you would give the level of freedom and rights that individuals have in the digital world today? Oh, on a scale of one to ten, <laughs> it depends on where you are. I mean, the, uh, it's, it hasn't gone very well. Um, I mean, the... I think re what Rebecca McKinnon was getting at, I think, is extremely important. I think that the basically what we've seen in the intervening eight years is uh, perhaps no surprise that basically the way in which citizens express their views is not as a citizen of the world, but as a citizen of a state. It's not the only way, but it tends to be the primary way. And so the reassertion of state sovereignty over cyberspace does not necessarily mean a loss of citizen, uh, you know, citizen autonomy and power. It should mean an increase in it. Uh, you know, the Canada has participated in the Prague Principles discussion on 5G, which is a very interesting forum that began in uh, 2018. Uh, basically, states keeping all the vendors out. They have states discuss the way forward. There were 32 or 33 participants in 2019. Uh, September 2020, they had over 120, 120 states participated uh, in the discussion early or last month. And they are really trying to come up with, and they've come up with a set of principles that get to a lot of the issues that Depine was just uh, was just talking about. So the urge among states to create a better framework is absolutely Absolutely there. Uh, it's very tricky, um, largely again, I think, because uh, because the role of the private sector is so great, and it's just simply not like arms control that the it's not up to to states to they don't control enough of the factors. Uh, but there, the effort is definitely there. It's very focused around 5G. Uh, China's policies have, have focused a lot of minds around the world. Uh, the only cautionary note I'd like to interject, because I think it's very important and gets forgotten, is that China is not a country that's going to disappear. Uh, it needs its own tech sector in order to achieve its own goals of growth in the future. And whatever you think of the Chinese government policies that aim to essentially eliminate its ability to, to innovate uh, on anything other than a purely domestic scale uh, could be counterproductive in a whole lot of ways that um, it might be useful to anticipate rather than just trying to uh, opt for a kind of uh, virtual containment policy and, and hope for the best, which I'm afraid might be something like what's happening now. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's our time, everybody. My sincerest thanks to Scott Malcolmson, Depayam Ghosh, and Ambassador Eileen Donahoe for being with us on TVO tonight. Thanks so much for your help on this, everybody. There has never been a relationship between a president of the United States and a television network in the way that Donald Trump has one with Fox News. 
So says the host of CNN's Reliable Sources, Brian Stelter, who chronicles this unprecedented and, he says, deeply concerning relationship for democracy in a new book. It's called Hoax, Donald Trump, Fox News, and the Dangerous Distortion of Truth. And Brian Stelter joins us now from Manhattan Island in New York City. It's good to meet you finally. I'm a big uh, fan of your show. I love the book, and I was also disturbed as hell by the book. How's that for an opening? Nice to meet you, Brian. <laughs> I can put that blurb on the back of the book. <laughs> for what it's worth. I'm sure that'll sell you two copies. Uh, let's start with this. Should, should we make the distinction between, say, the morning show guys and the primetime hosts and the news division of Fox, which thinks it covers the news pretty straight up? Yes, there is still a difference, but the difference is becoming blurrier and blurrier. The distinction is being lost. It's as if they had a brick wall between news and opinion, and the wall has been taken down brick by brick by brick, by brick in the Trump years. President Trump doesn't want news on Fox. He wants propaganda on Fox. And increasingly, that is what he's getting. Well, you say his number one chief propagandist is a guy by the name of Sean Hannity, uh, who is, uh, I guess he's the big anchor of the primetime lineup. And you tell us yeah. they speak. The president and the talk show host speak virtually every day. What in heaven's name do they talk about? Yeah, you want to find collusion in the Trump years. Here is the real collusion between Fox and Trump. Hannity and Trump are personal friends. They talk about their families. They talk about their lives, their grievances. Uh, but they also exchange talking points and themes and ideas for future shows. Um, and in the case of Hannity, he's also pushing for Trump to hire certain people or fire certain people. This is a back and forth relationship that turns Hannity, a television host, really an entertainer, into a shadow chief of staff. And, and I argue in hoax, you can't understand the Trump years and you certainly can't get beyond the Trump years without understanding Fox's role because it's really Fox that sets the agenda for Trump. It's Hannity that sets the agenda for Trump. Now, on the one hand, I I'm a little jealous of a guy who's got direct access to the top decision maker in the whole country. I'd love the prime minister of Canada to take my calls every day. So, uh, you know, on that hand, what's wrong with it? Well, I'm glad that, that Trudeau is not every single day getting misinformed by t television channels he watches. That's really at the heart of this problem. Trump is misinformed by what he hears on Fox. And then he goes on Twitter and shares that mis- and disinformation with the rest of the world. Uh, that's the real poison at the heart of the story. Um, I wouldn't have written this book if the president was getting really excellent, high-quality journalism from Fox every day. I wish he was, but he's not. What does Hannity genuinely, behind the scenes, think of Donald Trump? Well, that was one of the biggest surprises for me in this reporting, because Hannity is such a sycophant on air such a supporter no matter what, such a cheerleader for Trump no matter what. But behind the scenes, he has the same experience of Trump that so many former Trump advisors and officials have described. I'm talking about the John Boltons of the world who say that Trump is a run-on sentence, that he has crazy ideas. Uh, friends and, and associates of Hannity said to me, he, he says Trump is crazy. He knows Trump is crazy. He describes Trump as a run-on sentence. At one point, Hannity was vaping a lot early in the Trump years, and he said, You'd be vaping, too, if you knew what I was hearing. So there's a kind of stress that comes from being this unofficial advisor to Trump. There's a stress that comes from having to promote him on TV every day. But Hannity never admits it on TV, and there's a hypocrisy to that. If this is an unhealthy relationship, I would assume that Fox management oversees it and puts its two cents worth in from time to time with their most expensive host. Does that happen? That's what should happen. That's certainly what would happen at any other network. But the real story of Fox and the Trump years is a lack of leadership. Frankly, I think in some ways this is a business school case study about what goes wrong when a company is making a huge amount of money, $2 billion in profits a year, but then doesn't have a, a, a clear, strong, firm leader to set a tone and set an agenda and say, yes, that's appropriate. No, that's inappropriate. It's as if Hannity runs his own show and there's nobody holding him accountable. Hmm. Well, let's take a look at the coverage of COVID-19. For example, uh, Fox Television, all, many of the hosts, certainly in the primetime lineup, and even some of the news as well, was saying, yeah. look, this is not that big a deal. This is, again, six months ago. This is not that big a deal. Nothing to see here. Move right along. What were they actually doing at Fox headquarters while they were broadcasting that to the nation? Well, this is what's so disturbing about Fox's coverage of the pandemic. On the air, they were downplaying the disease. But off the air, uh, the place smelled like Lysol. 
You know, they were making all the same precautions that CNN was taking, that you were taking, that everybody was taking. Um, they were putting the hand sanitizer stations in place. They were starting to think about the, what, what the rules about masks would be. They were telling staffers to work from home. But on the air, the message was different. And I think fundamentally that was the problem with Fox's handling of the pandemic. Both Trump and Fox were always two or three steps behind where they needed to be. And, and um, you know, we'll never know what the cost in human lives and suffering is. Certainly there's a lot of blame to go around in the United States for all the failures of the pandemic. But Fox was the biggest channel, and uh, Trump, of course, had the biggest platform of all. Now, it's not as if nobody inside Fox was raising the flag on this, and I'm going to read a quote from your book here. On March 20th, 2018, Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Peters wrote a scathing memo to colleagues calling Fox a propaganda machine for a destructive and ethically ruinous administration. He said he was ashamed to work there, and he quit, dynamiting the bridge on his way out. Fox isn't <laughs> immoral, it's amoral, he concluded. The network's merger with Trump was opportunistic. Okay, that's that, that, nothing mealy-mouthed about that memo, but what impact did it right. have? I think it's incredible to hear someone who worked at Fox for years say that publicly. That doesn't happen in television. It never happens. I mean, no one's ever left CNN and said the place is amoral. And I mean, He's basically almost saying the channel's evil. It's, it's really a remarkable thing. He is one of many former Fox staffers who have those concerns, but Peter's actually shared it publicly. Others usually only share it in private. But what was the result? Really nothing. Now, nothing changed internally, nothing changed externally. Um, Fox has lost a lot of talent in the past few years because there's a lot of people there who don't feel like they fit in anymore in the Trump years. They don't want to be part of the propaganda but there are still plenty of people who are, are happy to wave the Trump flag 24 seven. Hmm. Now we Canadians, of course, sharing a very long border with you, get all of your channels and we do watch them. Right. But I suspect people have, well, I certainly didn't, and I'm in the business. People have no clue how much these people make. What do the primetime hosts <laughs> get paid? <laughs> yes, uh, this is a different stratosphere from most people in television. But at uh, Fox News, Sean Hannity is making 35, $40 million a year between his television and radio shows. Tucker Carlson makes $10 million a year. Brett Baer makes about $12 million. Some of this is depending on how many years they've been there. Some of this depends on, on how highly rated their shows are or whether they threatened to leave in the past and had other offers from other networks. But the, these figures are, you know, they're off the charts. And, and the reason is these hosts have a stranglehold on the audience. Um, Sean Hannity has four to five million viewers a night. There are many nights in the United States where that's the highest rated show on all of cable, not just news, but I'm talking about sports, entertainment. He's bigger than all of them. And that's because there is such a loyal audience that feels alienated by other news in the United States. They've been told for decades, Republicans have been told for decades not to trust the mainstream news media. And Hannity benefits from that. What conclusion did you come to as to whether or not they really believe everything that they're saying or they just understand that it's in their financial self-interest to tie their wagon so tightly to Trump. Right, you know, this is at the heart of the Fox story, and I don't know exactly how to answer it, to be honest with you, because some people do believe some of it, right? Uh, Sean Hannity, for example, he wants GOP policy victories. He wants conservatives on the Supreme Court. Many of Fox's morning stars and primetime stars support a Republican policy agenda. Where I think they struggle to support Trump in private is with this indefensible, reckless behavior. Look at him coming home from Walter Reed, right? Every week it's something new, some reckless, dangerous behavior by the president. And that's harder to defend, but they find ways to do it. Don't worry about these stars. They find ways to do it. They'll either change the subject, they'll make excuses, they'll say the Democrats are worse. That's really what Fox is at the heart. It's an anti-Democrat channel. Well, let me ask you about another personality that, that maybe some of our viewers will know, uh, Maria Bartiromo, who was really a, uh, she was a pretty good business reporter, I remember, when she was on her previous channel. She's now completely in the tank for Trump. What happened there? Yes. Yeah, I think this proves the incentive structures at Fox are all wrong. The incentive structures are not to report the news straight and try to get, uh, to tell a true story of what's happening in the Trump White House, all the scandals and controversies and mistakes and all that. The incentives instead are to appeal to a slavishly pro-Trump audience that doesn't want to hear bad news about the dear leader. And Bartiromo, she chases the ratings. She sees the ratings every day. She tries to do the same thing tomorrow and, and hold on to that audience. Um, look, 
I care about ratings too. I work at CNN. I see the ratings. But there's not that same obsession with appealing to the audience at all costs. I think that's the difference at Fox. Hmm. We've talked about some big names, but I want you to talk to us now about just sort of the average producer, the average researcher, the average reporter who works at Fox News, and whether they whether they are disturbed that they, from time to time, work in a news division that seems to actively falsify empirically provable facts. How do they feel about that? Yes, and there are reporters who have left as a result. Uh, there's a dozen examples in my book of people who looked around and said, I, don't, I can't stay here anymore. I don't fit in here anymore. Whether it was having to defend the family separation policy, kids being broken off from their parents at the U.S. southern border, uh, whether it's um, the Charlottesville and the president's reaction to those racists in Virginia. Uh, people looked around and said, I, I can't take it anymore. But a lot of producers and staffers do stay, whether for the money, whether for the power, whether because they're not sure they have other options, they're afraid they wouldn't get a job somewhere else, and also because Fox feels like a family. It's an us versus them dynamic. People think, well, I'm on one team. I can't leave to go to the arch rival team. There's a lot of that going on. It's an example of how U.S. politics has become so broken and polarized, so us versus them. And sadly, it's easier to be against something than for something, and that's the Fox model. Well, if you work for Fox News, are you almost ipso facto um, seen as tainted by MSNBC or CNN or any of the other channels for that matter? That's what NBC executives said to me. They said, we get a lot of resumes from some folks at Fox, but we view Fox as a different kind of company. We view it as a lifestyle brand. Hmm. Uh, what's a more accurate way to characterize the relationship between um, the Fox News division and the president? He tells them what to report or they tell him what to say? I think it is Fox that is setting the agenda more often. Hmm. They are telling him what to say. And I had producers of the morning show called Fox and Friends who said that to me over and over again. They said, people think he gives us talking points. Hell no, we give him talking points. We tell him what to say. Now, of course, this producer was bragging, but there's a lot of truth to it. I see it happen almost every morning. Even when the president was at the hospital, even when he was uh, in his hospital room, he was tweeting Fox and Friends quotes. That's the morning show. He was tweeting what he was hearing on Fox News and taking his cues from the morning show. <laughs> and that's you know, that's disturbing because this is not the highest quality content on American TV. This is lowbrow stuff. This is cheap stuff. You know, they're taking talking points from right wing websites and they're just talking about them. They're not doing original reporting. So that's really what's broken about this relationship between Trump and Fox. Well, let me play devil's advocate and go on to the other side. Uh, there might have been planes in the air over Iran dropping bombs, if not for Tucker Carlson. True? Yeah, isn't that an incredible story? Th that's the thing. This is a very complicated relationship because different stars at Fox have different relationships with the president. So Tucker Carlson, who is uh, a very much uh, a dove, he is uh, against uh, American um, escalations in foreign countries, he had the president's ear at that pivotal time. Uh, Iran had shot down a U.S. drone. Tucker was on the air, uh, um, loudly urging Trump not to retaliate, not to take action. And uh, there was a day, in, you know, back in June of 2019, when uh, the president said planes were locked and loaded. We were about to retaliate. And he was thinking about Tucker Carlson. Trump even called Tucker to get advice from Carlson. And ultimately, that strike was called off. It is an it is an amazing it is an amazing thing to think about that a, a television star can have that much influence. Does Tucker admit that it was his comments to the president that ultimately carried the day? Uh, no, and he's he's careful about this. You know, there were certainly other factors involved that day. There was a general on Fox who made some influential comments as well. Um, but Tucker Carlson does appreciate his power. He has four to five million viewers watching. He uses his program to uh, to um, advance an anti-immigration agenda. Many of his colleagues think he's promoting a white nationalist agenda. Of course, Tucker always denies that. But there is a lot of white identity politicking going on on Fox. It's a largely white channel with a white co Christian conservative audience that expresses this fear of multiculturalism, this resistance to a changing America. And that's going to be around regardless whether Trump wins or loses. I think that's what's important to know about Fox. This brand, this channel is so powerful, whether or not Trump wins or loses the election. Hmm. Let me raise another name here. Uh, people may remember a fellow by the name of Anthony Scaramucci, who was a friend of Trump's back in New York and then was the uh, director of communications in the White House for about a week and a half. And you've got him quoted in the book as saying, what I can't understand 
is why good people are willing to be accomplices to this nightmare. What do you think the answer to that is? If you believe that this is a nightmare in America, uh, I think this shows that voters who supported Trump, uh, they made choices that were not about his personality. They were not about um, what he was saying or what he was tweeting. It was about something much deeper in America, a resistance to a woman running for president, resistance to um, uh, diversity in the country. Clearly, racial resentment was a factor. Economic struggles were, were a factor. And so, you know, all of all of the noise that surrounds Trump, all of the controversies and scandals, all of the wheeling and dealing and the tweeting, a lot of his voters tune it out. And I think we have to recognize that. And you can see that in the Fox coverage, by the way. You know, Fox does not, um, they don't focus on the same scandals and controversies that the rest of the news media does. They make excuses and they change the subject to the Democrats. And it's much more about what Joe Biden is doing wrong versus what Trump might be doing right or wrong. Well, I do notice every now and then that a host is able to push back. And I do remember Neil Cavuto going on the air and saying, it's not fake news, Mr. President, that's your problem, yeah. it's you. Now, how did he get away yeah. with saying that? I mean, those are important moments because Fox is a, a critical messaging uh, vehicle for the president. He needs to hear the truth on Fox. They need to speak truth to power. And Neil Cavuto does it, Chris Wallace does it, uh, Brett Baer occasionally does it. But there's not many other people I can list off and say they are speaking truth to power. Um, Cavuto does it because he's been there forever. He's been there for a very long time. He feels very confident on his show. Um, but there's a lot of people at Fox who said to me anonymously, I don't feel I have power to speak up. I don't feel I have power to fact check the president, for example. So Cavuto is one of those exceptions. Well, the other one, of course, was Shepard Smith, who did the afternoon run and was, was quite critical of Trump when he wanted to be and when he felt the facts backed him up. What happened to him ultimately? Yeah, look, Shep, I remember Shep on Election Day 2016 criticizing Trump for lying about voter fraud. Trump on the day of the election was suggesting the election was rigged because he thought he was going to lose. So he was setting up a storyline for why he lost. And Shep called him out that day and Shep called him out for three years on. Uh, but Shep couldn't take it anymore either. He quit in 2019. Uh, he felt that he just he, he could not stay at a place where Tucker Carlson and others were making fun of him on the air. Um, you know, that kind of um, rivalries inside the network, those were a real problem. And because there isn't a, la a strong leader at Fox, Tucker was allowed to get away with it. So Shep quit. He went off to a new network, CNBC. He launched a new show. And you know, that sadly is what's happened again and again. As, as Fox has become Trumpier and Trumpier and Trumpier, real journalists have looked and headed to the exits. Shep was one of the very few openly gay people on that channel as well. Now that he's gone, is that demographic spoken for at all? That's an interesting point. Uh, you know, he, for example, one of one of Shep's many complaints about Fox was that the network has an on-air commentator, Robert Jeffress, uh, who has made anti-LGBT comments in the past, anti-gay comments in the past. And Shep was bothered that nobody else at Fox seemed to be bothered by that. Um, so, you know, he, he does leave a void in many ways. You know, when you're at a television network or a news outlet, you want a lot of people for the, with a lot of different points of view, a lot of different backgrounds, you know, and to the extent that Fox has become Trumpier and Trumpier, they've lost some of that. Hmm. Let's do another quote from the book here. You write, the word hoax was uttered more than 900 times on Fox News in the first six months of 2020. Every time Trump tweeted it or Hannity shouted it, a little bit more truth was chipped away from America's foundation, precisely at a time when the country was beset by multiple crises and needed honesty and accuracy, compassion and sound science. Mm. Let, let's pursue that for a moment or two here. How does, how does the relationship between the president and this television channel ultimately, in your view, put democracy at risk? Well, this is fundamentally what's broken in America, this idea that everything could be fake news, that everything could be a hoax. I hate that word hoax. I use it for the title of my book because it's such a nasty little word. It's so malicious. You know, it means that I'm trying to hurt you if I'm trying to pull a hoax on you. But Trump uses the word every day, almost every day. Fox uses it even more often. They go back and forth. They echo each other. And it's had real consequences for democracy. We don't have a common ground for facts and understanding of what's going on. By all means, we should fight about policy choices, but let's agree on the facts first and then fight over the, the choices. And we can't do that anymore in the country because this fake news hoax rhetoric has been so poisonous. I had a staffer at Fox say to me, Trump and Fox's alliance puts democracy at risk. 
And look, we're going to see what happens this fall, right? We're going to see what happens on election night. If the other networks say it's too early to call the election, but Fox comes out and says they think Trump has won, that's going to be deeply destabilizing. Now, I do not think that will happen because I think the, the people at Fox who make election projections are very trustworthy people. But there's a, a different problem as well. What if Sean Hannity and Trump and Laura Ingram and all these Fox prom, uh, Trump promoters at Fox, what if they claim the election was rigged, uh, even if Fox's news division says it was not? You know, that could create a real crisis for the country. Well, I remember, uh, I think I well remember uh, George W. Bush's second election, election victory, and there was actually a fight on the air election night as Karl Rove and Megyn Kelly, the anchor, had a disagreement about the status of the election at that point. Rove <laughs> saying, wait a second, this can't, this can't be true. Uh, <laughs> and Megyn Kelly saying, well, let's go into the back room and we'll talk to the people who have those numbers. Does that kind of tension I exist anymore? That. Yeah, I loved that transparency where Megyn Kelly showed the audience how the decisions are actually made. This is about science and data, not about uh, political agendas. Um, does that still exist? Yes, that same team that caused the elections does still exist. And I've spoken with people at CNN who say, we trust our colleagues at Fox who actually make those decisions about the elections. Um, but it's more, my concern is about the propagandists on Fox, Trump's friends on Fox, who might try to promote a different narrative uh, and ultimately, you know, that's, I think that's part of what's so wrong at Fox in the Trump age. They always give Trump the benefit of the doubt, even though he has lied to the country tens of thousands of times. They still take his word seriously. They still assume he's telling the truth. And that's a foolish thing, right? Like, fool me once, shame on, on you. But like, fool me twice, shame on me. Fool me 20,000 times, that's a lot of shame on me. I think there are a number of Canadians who take a little bit of pride in the fact that it's a guy from Toronto who's actually been counting all these lies up. Daniel Dale, formerly of the Toronto yes. Star, who's on your channel Thank all the time. Daniel Dale, a national <laughs> treasure. And it's so revealing. You know, think about what happened with Daniel Dale, right, of the Toronto Star. CNN grabbed him up because we so desperately needed a fact checker uh, full time. Fox never hired a fact checker in the Trump years. And I think that's kind of revealing about Fox's position. They're not as interested in knowing what is true and what is not true. They're more interested in a political agenda, a political narrative. But thankfully, uh, the other networks, I think, have done a better job of trying to uh, figure out what is true in the Trump years. And as Daniel Dale often points out, Trump says the same lies over and over again. So it's not that hard to unpack some of what he's saying. He tells really simple stories that are appealing to his base, but are not appealing to the rest of the country. Hmm. Brian, uh, we obviously, as we sit here, don't know who's going to win the election. It certainly looks good for Biden, but you can't say that just yet. But I presume at the highest levels of Fox News, they are having conversations about how they will reinterpret their mission if Trump loses and if Biden wins. Can you let us in on what's probably going on in those conversations? Yeah, in the Obama years, Fox called itself the voice of the opposition, meaning the opposition to Obama. And uh, the same thing is already becoming true at Fox they're already more focused on Biden, uh, trying to take Biden down and scrutinizing every word he says. I think uh, what Fox does with Kamala Harris will be especially notable, a woman of color. Uh, certainly there are a lot of Fox viewers who have very strong and very negative feelings about seeing a woman of color in a powerful position. So, uh, you know, it's interesting about Fox. It's kind of like heads they win, tails they win. They win either way in terms of ratings and profit. They win when a Republican is in office, and then they win when there's a Democrat in office because they're against the Democrat. Uh, how polarized the media climate is in the United States, how broken it is. Um, but I don't want to get into this claim that the both sides are equally bad. Um, MSNBC, liberal news outlets, you know, they don't engage in the same kind of propaganda for a Democrat that Fox engages in for a Republican. Fox is a unique animal. I guess it's an animal if it's a fox, a unique animal in American life. And uh, it has to be understood, I think, as um, something bigger than a television network. For its fans, it's an identity. It's almost a way of life. And I think, you know, in order to address it, make it better, respond to it, you have to understand its power. Well, let's finish up on this. The people, uh, I would suggest, who really should read your book are precisely the people who upon hearing about your book, will say, there they go again, to quote Ronald Reagan. There's that fake news again. <laughs> um, I, I mean, presumably that, uh, as an author who's put a lot of time and effort into writing a book, and who's spoken to, I think you had, what, 100 sources or more uh, for this book, 
I mean, that's a bit depressing, isn't it, that the people who you think really ought to read it and need to read it won't read it? It is distressing, but I believe that on a one-to-one -one basis, we can build bridges and make connections. I remember going to a Trump rally in 2018. CNN made me have a bodyguard with me, which really speaks to the poisonous environment we are in. I didn't actually have any safety concerns, but it was nice to have someone watching my back just in case. And as a result, I was able just to have really honest, relaxed conversations with Trump fans. And most of them, they didn't want to call me names. Sure, a few of them did, but most just wanted to take selfies. Most just wanted to talk to me and ask me questions. It reminds me that when we get past the name calling and insults and all that nonsense, we actually can still have conversations, but unfortunately that doesn't scale, right? I can't be at every Trump rally. I can't try to talk to every Fox viewer one-on-one. -on -one. Um, ultimately, any attempt to improve and reduce the polarization and the crazy flames and fire and war, it's only gonna happen uh, individually, right? Friend to friend, family member to family member. Well, we are very grateful on TVO tonight for this conversation with the author of Hoax, Donald Trump, Fox News, and the Dangerous Distortion of Truth. Brian Stelter, we enjoy you on Reliable Sources, and we're grateful you came onto our channel tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks. And that is the agenda for Wednesday, October 7th, 2020. Thousands of small businesses run in the concourses beneath office towers, or at least used to until COVID-19 sent many white collar workers home. Tomorrow, we'll consider the fate of that hidden office economy. Also, we'll check in on how post-secondary students find campus life so far this new academic year. I'm Steve Paik, and thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.